Questions from reasonablefaith.org. Dr. Craig, these are from all over the world. This question, Dr. Craig, a question about intrinsic defeater defeaters. I'm wondering how we can accept such a thing without stopping conversations. Now, I think we'd better explain what we mean here. By defeater to defeaters? Yes, or folks won't be able to follow this question. Okay. Uh, a defeater and then a defeater of the defeaters. So right. The idea of a, a defeater would be something that would um, invalidate your argument. It would show either that the conclusion uh, is false, in which case you've um, rebutted the, the argument, or you would show that the uh, conclusion hasn't been proven to be true, in which you've undercut the argument, so that defeaters could be either undercutting defeaters or uh, rebutting or refuting type defeaters. And if you're to be rational in maintaining your position, the person who offered the argument when confronted with these defeaters needs to offer a defeater of the defeaters. You need to give an answer to the defeater. Now, what Alvin Plantinga points out is that there could be such a thing as an intrinsic defeater defeater. That is to say, it could be a belief that is so powerfully warranted for us that it just intrinsically defeats the alleged defeaters that are brought against us. And he gives the example of someone who has been accused of a crime that he knows that he did not commit, but against whom all the evidence stands. So that if a jury were to weigh the evidence, they would convict him as being guilty, even though he's not guilty. And Plantinga says, in a case like this, am I obliged to follow the evidence where it leads and conclude with my peers that I am guilty, that I really committed the crime? And he says, no, even though all the evidence is against me, I know I didn't commit the crime. And so my belief in my own innocence is an intrinsic defeater of these defeaters brought against it. So that's the idea of an intrinsic defeater, defeater. And the claim is, couldn't the witness of the Holy Spirit, who warrants to us certain Christian beliefs, couldn't that warrant be so powerful that it intrinsically defeats the objections brought against it? For example, imagine a young person being raised in the old Soviet Union who's in a class being indoctrinated by a Marxist professor, and this is a young Christian. And he doesn't know how to rebut the arguments for atheism that the professor is bringing. But nevertheless, the warrant that the Holy Spirit gives to him of the truth of his Christian faith is so powerful that it simply overcomes those defeaters. Uh, and therefore, he is rational to continue to hold his Christian belief, even in the absence of a defeater of those alleged defeaters. And I do think, in fact, that the witness of the Holy Spirit can, in various circumstances, be so powerful as to be such an intrinsic defeater of defeaters. Following this, this question continues then. I'm wondering how we can accept such a thing without stopping conversations. For example, if I were in a conversation with a Muslim and I tried to present a, a defeater to Islam by attacking the reliability of the Quran concerning Jesus' death by crucifixion or Christian doctrine, why would they be unable to appeal to their experience of Allah as a defeater to any objections I might have against Islam? It seems to me the idea of an intrinsic defeater defeater might be so liberal in its application that just about any theist monotheist, polytheist, pantheist, can justify their belief enough, uh, can justify their belief through this reasoning. I'm sure there is an answer to this question, as it seems that such a seemingly major problem cannot simply have been unconsidered or ignored. Well, he's exactly <laughs> right. It, it is not unconsidered or ignored. Planning a, refers to this uh, first as the great pumpkin objection and then in his more recent work, Warranted Christian Belief, he calls it the son of the great pumpkin 
uh, objection. And um, what Plantinga points out is that uh, Muslims can also make such a claim uh, to have a personal experience of God that defeats the defeaters brought against them. That of course they can. Uh, no one would deny that they could make such a claim. But that isn't to say that they actually do have such an intrinsic defeater. defeater. Uh, if Christianity is true, then what they have is either a delusory emotional experience that's purely psychological, or else they have some general experience of God that would warrant, say, belief in God's existence, but not specific Islamic uh, doctrines. So if that is the case, what we need to do is to present to them arguments and evidence that would show that Islam is not true, and hope that, as we do this prayerfully, that the Holy Spirit of God will use that to crack their false confidence in Islam, and the truth will break through. So the mere fact that somebody falsely claims to have an intrinsic defeater defeater for their beliefs does nothing to stop conversations. You go right ahead, present your arguments, pray for that person, and hope and trust that the Lord will break through that counterfeit experience to um, defeat their belief in falsehood and bring them to the truth. Another question. Dear Dr. Craig, I'm a high school senior student and my history teacher in my world history class on the subject of religion taught the class and blatantly stated that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. I myself am a Christian and I very well know that we don't worship the same God. How would you approach him and correct him on his misunderstanding? I don't feel equipped to tell him with the knowledge that I have. I would greatly appreciate your approach and way of doing so. Thanks in advance in Christ. I'm old school on this in that I think that in a classroom situation, the professor is there to teach the students and the students are there to learn from the professor, not to challenge him or correct him. So I would encourage the student not to think it's his responsibility to correct his professor, but what he could do is simply raise questions. Uh, for example, a good question of raise in this context would be to say, but teacher, what about the Christian concept of the Trinity? Don't Christians believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And don't Muslims condemn this doctrine? Don't they say that anyone who believes that is, is going to hell? So don't Muslims themselves show that they're not worshiping the same God that Christians are, are, are worshiping? And I, that would be the way I would approach it is by probing with these kinds of questions. Asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th that's, that's appropriate and civil mm -hmm. as far as the uh, practicality uh, of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I tell you, uh, students can really make fools of themselves and really be belligerent in class. It's just not appropriate. Um, Christians can put their foot, foot in their mouth, too on things like this. And so asking it in a form of a question is something that the professor would appreciate more? Well, I'm sure he would. And I think a question like this can get to the, the truth of the situation. You can see that the Christian concept of God is very different than the Muslim concept of God and that Muslims themselves will tell you this. Well, another thing is is that uh, not only there's the the way he would do this, but he would also maybe want to give some reasons for why this is the case. And so that's one that you mentioned there, mm -hmm. the strict monotheistic God of the... Of, well, not of, monotheistic. We're both monotheistic. It's Unitarian. Unitarian. The, Islam is a form of Unitarianism, interestingly enough, uh, whereas Christianity is Trinitarianism. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're Unitarian monotheists, we're Trinitarian right. monotheists. Uh, and so on. what about uh, maybe 
uh, studying up on this a little bit and then get with the teacher one-on-one. -on -one. Would that be appropriate? I think that would be fine, particularly if it's a university teacher. They typically keep office hours and you can go in and talk to them. I Well, this fellow says he's a high school yeah, student. Yeah, high school senior. Um, so at best, maybe he could linger after class or come in after school when the teacher is maybe still sitting at his desk uh, working and raise these issues um, with him. Okay, another question. Hello, Dr. Craig. Thank you for all the work you've done in the field of theology and apologetics. I have found both your defenders and Reasonable Faith Podcast helpful in my studies as I'm working towards becoming a theology teacher. I am currently enrolled at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, working towards my MA. My question is this, while reading A.C. Grayling's book, The God Argument, The Case Against Religion and For Humanism, he gives a critique of the ontological argument in this way. On what grounds is it claimed that it is possible that anything is necessary? In fact, the argument is question begging, for by saying that there is a world in which something is necessary, by the definition of necessary, what is thereby being asserted is that it has to exist in every possible world. Yet with equal, equal plausibility, it can be claimed that there is a possible world in which nothing exists necessarily, which means there is a possible world in which everything is contingent. And if this is possible, as far as, uh, as it surely is, our own world is such a world, then it follows that nothing is necessary because only if it is not possible for there to be a world in which nothing is necessary can there be any necessarily existing thing. For remember, such a thing would have to exist in every possible world. End of quote there from Grayling. Would you offer some insights into this critique? Once again, thank you for all you do, Matt. Sure. Now that may have been rather difficult for listeners to digest with all of the, the terminology be, being thrown around, but it seems to me that Grayling here um, offers a couple of objections that he tends to run together. The first one uh, is on what grounds is it claimed that it's possible that something is necessary? Well, now that's the first premise of the ontological argument, that it's possible that a maximally great being exists. And what grounds are there for that? Well, one would be simply our modal intuitions. We think about the concept of a maximally great being, a being who is omnipotent, omniscient, morally perfect, and exists in every possible world. And that seems to be a perfectly coherent concept, um, and therefore something that is possibly instantiated. So the first ground would be that sort of modal insight into the concept of a maximally great being. The second would be, I think, that there can be um, support for the possibility of this concept from the other theistic arguments. For example, Leibniz's argument leads to the existence of a metaphysically necessary being, which is the explanation for why anything at all exists. The moral argument leads to the existence of a metaphysically necessary being, which is the ground of objective moral value and duty. So the other theistic arguments can help to support the credibility of that first premise that it is indeed possible that such a being exists. Now, what about Grayling's claim then, secondly, that, well, there is a possible world in which nothing exists necessarily. I would say to him, what grounds do you have for believing that? You cannot know that that is true unless you know that the concept of a maximally great being is incoherent. And that does beg the question. As long as that's a coherent concept, then it isn't possible that there is a world in which nothing exists necessarily. Certainly not our world, as I said <laughs> uh, in my enthusiasm. That's really question-begging to assume that God doesn't exist. Um, so that assumption that he would counter poise to the first premise is one that I think you can't know to be true unless you know that maximal greatness is incoherent, which we don't know. 
Um, finally, he says, is the argument question begging? Well, I think it's very clear that it's not question begging. You are not assuming that God's existence is possible because you assume that God exists. Um, rather, you're saying that we have good reasons, uh, both a priori, prior to experience, and a posteriori, from experience, to think that that first premise is true. So, the ontological argument isn't a knockdown argument, but I think it's one that is, is plausible and credible. And I typically just leave it with my audiences as to whether they think the first premise is true or not. Rather than argue with them about it, I'll, I'll just say, I'll leave it to you. Do you think that it's possible, as I do, that God exists? Then it follows that he does exist. And I think even that conditional claim, Kevin, is, is radical enough to really make people think. In the history of the ontological argument, I was going to ask you about it, Bill. Uh, uh, Anselm, when, he, when this came upon him, he, he, he was stunned by it, yes. it seems. He, he almost thinks it was inspired. Hmm. I mean, I, that's what he, and he, I don't think he goes that far. You know, and um, I wish God would do that to me. Hey, God, give me a, a knockdown argument, you know, uh, kind of a thing, and uh, or, or or give me this great insight, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll if you'll do that, I'll go publish it, you know. <laughs> um, but he, tr it, it 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 stuns, it stunned him. It still stuns us today. Yes, he but. came upon this argument only after a futile attempt to find some argument for God's existence that would conclude to God with all of his superlative attributes and powers and the other arguments such as the cosmological argument or arguments for design don't get you to that elevated a concept of God as does the ontological argument. So when this uh, occurred to Anselm, you're right, it, it was almost like a revelation. One more question today, Dr. Craig. Uh, dear Dr. Craig, I recently read your Q&A response number 212, A Molinist Perspective on Biblical Inspiration. In it, you state that inspiration is a property of the written text and the essential difference between the Bible and other writings lies in God's attitude towards what is written. Could you provide some clarification on the property of inspiration? What does it mean to say a written text is inspired? How do we recognize when something is inspired? Is inspiration limited to the canonized biblical text, or are there other works that also hold this property? Thank you for all the insight you provide through your debates, writings, resources at Reasonable Faith. Your work has helped me in ways I cannot fully express. I'll wait for your response before calling them <laughs> an inspiration. Yeah. My best to you and your staff, Michael. <laughs> well, certainly my response is not uh, an inspiration in the same sense that we're talking about the biblical text being inspired. And he's quite right to point out that inspiration is not so much a property of the authors as when we say, oh, the author was inspired to write this. Rather, it is the text that is inspired. The word inspired means God breathed. Uh, this text is from God. Um, and when he says the essential difference between the Bible and other writings lies in God's attitude toward what is written. What I mean by that is that given God's providence over everything, everything that you do, everything you write, is ultimately under God's superintendence and control. So what makes what the biblical authors wrote essentially different such that it is inspired? Well, I think it is in God's attitude toward it, namely that he intends this writing to be his revealed word to us. He has so superintended the writing of these documents that they are God's word to us. So that's where I would see the difference. Um, and why is this a Molinist perspective? I mean, I, I oh, encourage people to go Because I'm trying to give a theory of biblical inspiration that will enable us to say that the Bible is fully inspired throughout down to the very words that the authors use and yet without dictation. And in that it can 
contrasts with a Muslim theory of the inspiration of the Quran. For a Muslim, the Quran is literally God's dictation. God dictated it, and Muhammad merely wrote it down. We have a very different attitude toward the writings of the Bible. We believe that these are the products of human authors, and that they reflect the personalities and the vocabularies and the experiences of their human authors. Uh, these are not just mechanical dictations. These writers were not merely secretaries who took dictation. They were creative authors. These are their letters and prophecies and gospels and so forth. God didn't bypass their humanity in the inspiration process. That's Is that what right. you're saying? Right. He used it. He used their humanity to produce the products that he wanted produced. Um, and he intends what they wrote to be his word to us. And so that is wherein I see the essential difference between what they wrote and what I write, for example. Now, how do we recognize when something is inspired? I, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I take it that the biblical text is inspired and that nothing else is inspired. So I, I would say, yes, inspiration is limited to the canonized biblical text, and there are no other works that have the property of being God's word. There's nothing else that has been written that God intends to be his word to us. And I suppose I would say that not on the basis of some quality of the text that you can tell by reading it, it's inspired, but it would be more on the testimony of Jesus to the writings of the Old Testament where he treated them as God's word and very often the New Testament authors will say the Holy Spirit said and then they quote something that David wrote mm -hmm. in the Psalms. They regarded these as God's word and Jesus said and promised that he would bring to the disciples remembrance everything that he taught them. Um, so I think we would hold to the inspiration of the canonical text, that is the biblical texts, um, on the basis of the way it was regarded by Jesus and the church itself. I like the way you put that, Bill, and that is that the Old Testament, and the, New, the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament have this divine stamp of approval from Jesus himself, and then you can argue for Jesus' authority for that divine stamp yes. of approval based on his resurrection right. and, and so on. And, and that's, not, that's not circular no. because that's using the New Testament as historical documents and, and what we have there and what historians yeah. and critics say. So. Yeah. And you can find even within the New Testament letters themselves that they were thinking of these as inspired by God. In, I think it's Second Peter, the author says... Um, of the Apostle Paul's letters. He says, in them there are many things that are difficult to understand, which the unlearned twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Wow. Now here in this very early letter, the letters of Paul are already being equated with scripture, which is really quite extraordinary, I think. 